Did you get her? No. She, she got away. She got away. <laughs> we are the First Southern Baptist Church of Yucca, Arizona. Yucca, Arizona is a little dot on the map between Lake Havasu City, uh, that's where the London Bridge is, and uh, Kingman, Arizona. And I don't know what's in Kingman. Um, oh, Road 66. There we go. Oh, Andy Devine. Yes. There you go. Good old Andy Devine. Um, but anyway, we are currently studying the um, 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. Uh, we've actually been on the entire book of, Re of the Revelation. And tonight we're going to be doing a little bit of recapping of that entire book because it is what is bringing us up to this thing called the Battle of Armageddon. Yes. If I said the word Armageddon to you before you ever even heard of, of the God who saved you, in other words, before you were a Christian, uh, you would have some understanding of what Armageddon is. It's that last great big battle. It's, it's, it's signaling the end of all times. The, the end of the world is coming. Armageddon, uh, that word along with... Uh, uh, apocalypse. Uh, yes. Those those two words. Most people out there understand what those words yeah. mean. We're talking about end times, and that portion of it is in line with the teachings <laughs> of the Bible. However, <clears throat> people look at Armageddon as a bad thing. Oh my gosh, the end of the world is coming, uh, my friends. Uh, God says that this is a glorious time. Uh, Armageddon is a time when all heaven will rejoice. Um, we're going to push through this uh, chapter tonight. It is strange that for a, a topic that is so well known to people even outside uh, the Word of God, outside of Christendom, uh, it is... It is possibly the most abused of all, of all scriptures in that there's not really that much directly in the Bible that talks about Armageddon. Did you know that the word Armageddon only, only is seen in one place in the Bible? We're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, did you know that the word Armageddon was created by the Apostle John, the same one who wrote the, the Gospel of John, John 1, 2, and 3? Um, and of course the Revelation. Uh, one of Jesus' uh, apostles, if you will. Uh, he was the last of the living apostles, and he of course wrote the Revelation of Jesus Christ. So why don't we start there with people that haven't been with us, because you won't get the entire book of Revelation given to you tonight. However, if you leave here understanding this one thing, you will probably retain pretty much what everybody who studied the whole thing, the name of the book. What is the name of the book? The revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation simply means to reveal. Uh, so what is happening in the book of Revelation is Jesus, the Messiah, the true Messiah, the, the one who came who died on the cross, uh, things that we do understand, is letting everybody in the world know exactly who he is. Now, for some of us, we took the easy road. Um, we gave our lives to Christ, and we don't need to be introduced, reintroduced to Jesus. When we came to him, we know who he is. We, at least we know who he is in our lives. Can we learn more about him? Of course we can. And yeah. scripture last week, we will never truly understand all that he is. However, the Christian knows Jesus Christ. How do we know him? We know him as our Savior. So the rest of the world, however, does not know Jesus Christ as his Savior. They know Jesus Christ possibly as a swear word. I remember one time standing in line in a bank, with a, a, an Asian bank. Um, most people in there were Asian, and they were talking Asian talk. And in the middle, they go, Jesus Christ! And back again, Jesus Christ! Because it was a slow line. 
So most people know Jesus Christ in that sense. They use yeah. it as a swear word, but they don't have a relationship with Christ. And by the way, it doesn't make a whole hill of beans what church you go to. The true church is right here. Yeah. So that's, if you get that out of it, the name of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is revealing himself to a world who does not know him. Having said that, a lot of people say, then why are we who know him studying this book? Because this book also comes with blessings, and the, it actually is the only book that ever says that there are blessings in anyone who reads this book. So, but we are talking tonight about Armageddon. Armageddon comes to us in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. And 19, chapter 19, this will be our third week on chapter 19. This goes against my promise to Barbara that we move quickly. But when we get to chapter 19, we have the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where we actually go through a marriage ceremony with our groom, who is Jesus Christ. Uh, and then we have, uh, after the marriage supper, I'm sorry, the marriage of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then secondly, uh, we had what we saw last week. And last, last week we were introduced to the return of Jesus Christ. That's very important. We had a whole message on just the return of Jesus Christ. This, the Battle of Armageddon, is sort of a continuation of the return of Jesus Christ because on his return there is not a party waiting there for him to celebrate while Christ is returned. As we said last week, most of the people who believed in him were, were killed by the Antichrist. Uh, maybe a small group of, of believers still remain. We know the 144,000 still remain, but that's pretty minimal on earth this size. Uh, but uh, most of the people that are waiting for him are waiting for him to kill him, to come against him. And that is that great battle of Armageddon that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I've cautioned people many times about uh, the revelation being in chronological order. What I've cautioned people about is trying to understand it in chronological order. In other words, our timing. Because it's so hard, well what came first, this or that or that or this. Uh, we are being given the revelation of Jesus Christ outside of time and space. Uh, John is looking through a porthole that possibly only God can see. Maybe other angels in heaven, I don't know. But they're in a different dimension than what we are. And they're not on daylight savings time. And they're not on daylight savings time, that's right. Um, but there is a progression of sorts. And the progression is done in, in sevens. For example... Jesus begins by speaking to the seven churches of Asia. He got that out of the way. Then we had the seven seals that were on the scroll. Do you remember that? One by one, Jesus opened the, uh, each seal on the scroll. And that scroll, of course, was the deed to planet Earth. Uh, after the scrolls, the, seventh op the opening of the seventh scroll gave way to the seven uh, sounding of trumpets, seven trumpets of judgment. And there's only seven Trump, there's only seven judgments that come in the book of Revelation because everything else comes out of uh, that seventh trumpet. When it sounds, then God sends seven bowls of his wrath. So if you understand the sevens, there is a progression in the numbering of the sevens. But there is there's uh, there's you can't really put a, a clock, a chronological clock, what comes first or last. But there is one thing that you can do. We know that this is a time of Jacob's trouble, and that is a seven-year period of time. How do we know that? Because uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 7 tells us that. Also, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, uh, not your book. That's a potato salad book, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> uh, he loves Sandy's potato salad. Do you know that takes me three hours to make? Daniel. You? Me and Sandy. Yeah. So. Him and Sandy. <laughs> Wayne does all the potatoes. I do the hard stuff. I boil the potatoes and the eggs. I peel. No, I peel. 
Yes, too. Got a lot of practice in the Marine Corps, huh? Yeah. Um, <laughs> then I wash all the dishes. Uh, so it's not an easy job, Annie. Yeah. You don't even really expect those things. Anyway, back to where it's seven, seven, seven. Everything's a seven, seven, seven. But seven broken half is three and one half. So the time frame of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the total thing is seven years. Okay? And we get that from the book of Daniel, which we'll bring up in a little bit. Uh, in the middle of the seven-year period of time, things really go crazy. At the beginning of the, the, or the end of the first three and one half years, I'm sorry, uh, the Antichrist has risen to power, and he has somehow rebuilt the temple of God in Jerusalem. Uh, and he steps into the steps into that uh, temple and he proclaims himself to be God. At that point, all literal hell breaks loose. If you remember Jesus, when, when he was talking in Matthew chapter 24, he said he said that he called it the abomination of desolation. When you see, talking to the Jews, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, everybody get out of town. Don't even go back down and grab your coat because all literal hell is going to break yes. loose. So there is a timeline to it in a sense and then the seven year period is split in half. But, and after that, you see the sounding of the seventh trumpet and God pouring out uh, seven bowls of his wrath. These are not funny things, my friends. We just came through all this. Chapter 16, 17, <coughs> and 18. And the fall of Babylon the Great. Babylon and all the cities of the, of the world are totally destroyed. The world is practically unrecognizable. And yet there are still people out there waiting just to kill this guy named Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, and that's what we see in <clears throat> chapter 19 we see Jesus coming back and with him of course he's bringing all of his people now the way I teach is I go through and I kind of paraphrase all this but now I ask you to read Roman numeral number one with me and we'll go through the same thing that I just said again okay <laughs> the word Armageddon strikes fear in the hearts of mankind most people associate the Battle of Armageddon with, in, with an end-of-the-world scenario. The very word conjures up visions of mass sufferings, armies, and widespread devastation. However, much of what has been propagandized in the minds of most people is not based on the biblical platform from which the term originated. The, that term, that name, was given to us by the Apostle John in the writing of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And while that book does describe many horrific events, for the ones who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind, Armageddon will be a glorious event. In fact, heaven will rejoice on that day. I believe that we, the church, will be riding with Jesus as he returns to that great battle of Armageddon. We are his bride, and, I, and he's coming down to reign for a thousand years. I don't believe that Jesus is going to leave his bride alone for a thousand years. We'll be coming with him. We are the armies of heaven, and uh, we'll talk more about that later. And I just talked about chron chronology. I have cautioned through our study of the Revelation that this Revelation is not necessarily given to us in chronological order. However, we are given three groups of sevens, actually four if you count the seven churches. Uh, the, and then the, the loosening of the seven seals, the uh, seven uh, which possess the deed to planet Earth. Uh, number two, the sounding of the trumpets of judgment. Oh, and there's each one of those judgments after you get past five, six, and seven carry an, a, a, an associated woe. Uh, whoa, it's, it's trumpet number five. Whoa, it's trumpet number six. Whoa, it is trumpet number seven. And each one of those woes adds more pain and suffering to what's being dished out 
in yeah. the great tribulation. <laughs> so what I'm giving you is a basic outline to build us up to this great uh, battle. Uh, but from start to finish, everything will be accomplished in a seven year period of time. This period of time is dedicated to the Jewish nation, Israel. It is a time of Jacob's trouble. However, the whole world will be going through it because it's coming against a nation, the nation Israel, <coughs> whom we should always be on their side, by the way. But God says they denied him. They crucified him. They rejected him. Okay? So they are going through this period of time, this time of, of great trouble. But there's a whole world out here that's doing the same thing. I, I'm told we, we have somewhere around 2,000 people uh, in our community now, up from 700 when I got here. Wow. And uh, we still, we're doing well. We've got maybe 35, 40 people here tonight and 75 on Sunday, I guess. Uh, but still, the, there's so much of the world that's out there. Yes. The world's out there. They don't know Jesus. Um, so they're coming, God is coming to bring judgment on a Christ-rejecting world. Again, back to the title. They are, Christ is revealing himself to a, a world that doesn't know him. We know Jesus as the one who loved us, who died for us. But there's another side of Jesus. There's a side of judgment. And for those who reject him, they've only got coming what they had coming when they were born. They were sinners when they were born. The wages of sin is death. So what he's doing, he's spanking the world, trying to get them into shape. Just like you do with a child that won't listen to you. Eventually you've got to take them out and give them uh, the woodshed experience, right? Um, yeah. Except for your son, he's too big. Um, <laughs> He's a good boy. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> that's cause, that's cause you know. <laughs> uh, anyway. So, all I can say about time is the beginning begins at the beginning, and the end will end at the ending. I thought that was very... Uh, so deep. So deep. Pro, pro, yeah, so, so deep. deep. Yeah. Wait till you hear my one about Thursday. If... If, um, if Sunday is the first day of the week and Monday is the second day of the week, which one comes first? <laughs> hey, it's in one of my messages. I, I saw. I've said all this to let us look at the beginning of tonight's topic, the famous battle of Armageddon. In doing so, we must recap some various portions of the apocalyptic writings of the Apostle John. John's description is only of what he saw and what he heard. You have to remember that everything that, that is being given to us was something that John saw and heard, or only heard, or only saw. But he tells us in each case, I saw or I heard. And it's, it's appealing to our senses. Uh, in chapter 4, John was taken to heaven. Uh, he was, chapter 4, verse 1 says, I was, I was in the Spirit uh, on the Lord's day, and suddenly I looked and a window or door opening in heaven. Instantly I was around the throne of God with 24 elders, and there were, and, and there were four living creatures. Each one of the living creatures had a face of, of one of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, and John. Uh, so what we're looking at, John gets up there, he sees the church. He sees the elders of the church, and he sees the representatives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the living creatures. Okay, we, we had messages all about this. So he's in heaven, and then there's a big scene around the heaven where Jesus takes the scroll. Then in chapter 6, John looks out, um, and with the... He, he sees the writing of a man of sin, whom we've come to know as the writer, being the Antichrist. With him are riders on black horses, pale horses, and uh, red horses. He's got some bad company riding with him. Well, this man of sin uh, will 
get his act together and rise to power over that first three and one half year period. See there, if you start talking about the numbers, you can get the divisions. It's not, there will be a three and a half year division. And he will rise to power during that three and a half year period. In fact, um, I've got a, uh, okay, here it is. During the first three and a half years, this man will rise to power as a world dictator. He will quote, this is the book of Daniel speaking, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's seven years. One week is seven uh, weeks of years. But in the middle of that week, after three and a half years, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. That's Daniel 9, 27. This, this scripture in Daniel parallels to exactly what Jesus said. He said, when you, therefore, when you see that abomination of desolation that's spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, the holy place means that they're in the temple. And right now there is no temple in Jerusalem. So if the rapture, which we talked about in chapter 4, happens tomorrow, the Antichrist only has three and one half years to build that temple. Yeah. Put these scriptures together. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So the first three and a half years haven't been that bad. Uh, they, they've been working, Israel has been working with this man of sin because they don't recognize him for who yes. he is. He's rising to power. He's going to be coming into a time when everybody's going, peace and safety, wow, look what this man has done yes. for us. But at that time, when he steps into that temple, here's the scripture, this comes to us from the, the uh, book of 2 Timothy. Mm -hmm. The apostle Paul further identifies this abomination, stating that the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is not Satan, but this is Satan's culprit. This is Satan's uh, sidekick, if you will. He's the Antichrist. And this is, the Apostle Paul is telling us that this gives us this thing that happens at that abomination. What's going to cause the abomination? It's when this Antichrist sets in the temple of God, proclaims to be God. Now we also know at that very time, we were just told by Daniel, that that's the middle of a three and a half year period of time. So when is it? It's three and a half years into the Great Tribulation. Although there's not a lot of tribulation, there are there's some things where the mountains fled away and the sea was uh, turned to blood for a little bit. But these are things that that man of sin will step in and solve these problems and it'll be quieted down and he's going to build that temple in the middle of that seven year period. He's going to break his promise. He's going to go to the uh, temple. He's going to proclaim himself to be God. This is the abomination of desolation which Jesus and Daniel both spoke. Chronologically, this event will happen in the middle, that three and a half year period, of the Great Tribulation. That division point of the Great Tribulation, God will then give Satan, this is what's weird, and you've got to understand this, when, God's, when, when the Antichrist does this, there's something else that happens in heaven, it's not in the script here, but Satan is kicked out of heaven. And he is given three and one half years left before he will be thrown into the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. So that three and a half year division point is very, very important in the book of Revelation. And things get heated up from here on in. Uh, so he's going to have three and a half years of free range on earth. And God's going to give it to him. He was given a mouth speaking great things, blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's Revelation 13, 5. 42 months is three and a half years. And that's the last three and a half years of man's rule on this planet. And Satan and his two sidekicks are not happy about it. They are mad, mad, mad. They're mad. Okay? During, during that time, God will pour out the seven bowls of his wrath. Seven, seven, seven. 
Now we come to the last seven, and it's seven bowls of God's wrath. Why is that important? Because when we get to the sixth bowl of God's wrath, something happens. When he pours out the sixth bowl, the great river Euphrates was dried up. It's already starting to dry up by the Yes. Time. Okay? Uh, and maybe God's getting it ready. I don't know what, what's happening, but the river Euphrates will dry up, and it's going to make a route for the kings of the east to come on down to Jerusalem. Come on down. Okay? At that time, this is important, at that time, John saw this. Remember when we're, we're in chapter uh, 13? John saw, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. He doesn't say they are frogs. He said, I saw unclean spirits. He identified them. They're like frogs. They're probably jumping out of the mouth of the dragon. Do you remember who the dragon is? That's Satan. Out of the mouth of the beast, the beast is the Antichrist. And out of the beef, beef, out of the mouth of the false prophet. So this is your unholy trinity, if you will. The dragon, the beast, and the mouth, and the uh, false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which then go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them together <clears throat> for that great battle of that great day of God Almighty. All this was to bring us to this point so that we all understand that this war has been building up and building up. The kings of the earth are waiting for an opportunity to get at this lamb, to stop this God, to spring in this devastation upon the world. Uh, Satan wants his domain. Satan wants the world. And he's fighting God all the way. Notice, notice what it says, and I've got it bolded and underlined. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which will go out to the kings of the earth and uh, kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. People, people worry about this thing called Armageddon. To God, this is a great thing. To us, this is going to be a great thing. <clears throat> These are not our friends. Especially the ones that are left. They're out to kill us at that point. Now, if you're still around, if, if you didn't make it in the rapture, and you've given your life to Christ, these are your enemies looking to kill you. And you're going to be kind of great, uh, glad when you see Jesus coming on the clouds with, with his hosts from heaven. And wow, you, it's going to be a great day of God Almighty. That's right. And what's strange, this is one of the... Uh, Strangest places for Jesus to speak. See the red letter edition? Yep. Right in the middle of them. We, we spent some time studying this as we went through chapter 13. <clears throat> Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. What if, what if you just happen to be in one of the armies of this king? It's a good time to go able. Okay? It's a good time to go AWOL. Yeah. You're better off to go AWOL uh, than, than you are to stay in this battle. Uh, but Jesus is saying to him, uh, I'm coming as a thief. Thieves don't, by the way, people say, oh, Jesus is coming as a thief. And no, he's not. Jesus will never come to the church as a thief. Yeah. Jesus will come unexpectedly as a groom, and he'll call out his bride, but Jesus will never come to the church as a thief. A thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And Jesus will be coming to his, his love, his church, to call them out. Uh, the Lord will descend from heaven, that trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ, rise first, and we who are left alive will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we forever be with the Lord. That's how Jesus is coming to his church. Now, and they gathered them together to the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. Okay? There it is. There's the time, one time. It's, it's, by the way, Armageddon is, is a small hill uh, called Eagle, and you put the two Hebrew words together, you get Armageddon, and uh, it overlooks a plain uh, it's a huge plain. Many, many battles have been fought there. 
and the last great battle will be fought there. Uh, this is the only word, only place in the Word of God that says the word Armageddon. Yet you would think, especially when an apocalyptic type of writing like we're reading, you would be seeing the word Armageddon, Armageddon, Armageddon all the way through. You don't. You see devastation, 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 but you don't see the word Armageddon. Uh, the 17th chapter, I'm reading on here, of the Revelation will give us a better idea of what who these armies are going to be. Okay, They're going to be coming against God for that battle of Armageddon. Remember that the... the, the Spirits like frogs went out to all the kings of the earth, okay? And they got the kings all riled up, and they said, hey, the river Euphrates has dried up. Let's go get this guy. It's causing us all this trouble. And they, they set about a place, and they're about six miles outside of Jerusalem in this place called Armageddon. So. <clears throat> hmm. These armies will be following a world dictator. We talked a little bit about that world dictator a few, a few weeks back. Remember, he's known as the beast or the antichrist. He will revive the ancient Roman Empire. Why do we believe that? Because he's going to rule them from a place which is built on seven mountains. So we did a study a few weeks back, remember. Rome is called the city of seven hills. Yeah, hills or mountains. So what, this antichrist will be ruling from Rome. And by the way, uh, the book of Daniel talks about a, a statue made of, of gold, uh, silver, bronze, and iron. And that last, that last kingdom on that statue is Rome. And of course, Rome was never conquered. Rome exists today in the United States of America. Rome exists in, in Europe. Uh, pretty much all over the, the known world at that time, Rome was, was the conqueror. They were never conquered. They, they just sort of split up into different countries. Little European countries, and a lot of those European countries came over here on the Mayflower, etc., etc. So, where is, where is Rome today? Rome is the world. And, but this, this king, this Antichrist, will be ruling from, from Rome, because he's going to be ruling from the city uh, of Seven Hills. Thus, chapter tells us this army is ready to go and fight with God Almighty. Where do you think they're going to go to find God and his people? Where would be a good place to find God and his people? Jerusalem. You know, the Bible says that in the last days, Jerusalem will be a burdensome stone around the necks of the kings of the earth. And that's happening right now. That's happening right now. People get ready. There's a train coming. Don't need no ticket. You just get on board. Right? Amen. We like music. <laughs> this chapter 17 it, it was very important because we found out where this army is coming from. But even more so, we'll be coming with them. Look at this. The people, it says, from those locations for Antichrist will command ten kings to make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called. Not chosen and faithful. So we are the call, the chosen, and the faithful. And when we get over into the book of Revelation, uh, book of, uh, uh, we're in the book of, <laughs> never mind. We're going to see that we returned with Christ, and those who came with him were all dressed in white linens, and we just went through a thing being told that when we get to heaven and we're the bride of Christ, we will be adorned in white linen, clean and bright. Uh, so they're going to go to Jerusalem as John continues viewing this climatic return of Christ, he saw and heard the following. We are finally now going to get into the scriptures that talk about the great battle of Armageddon. At this point, most of you need to go to sleep because there's not much there. The whole battle of Armageddon, we don't, we don't fire a shot. No, I'm not sure how many shots get fired at us, but it doesn't hurt a single one of us. Um, but here's what is going to happen the battle of Armageddon. Then I saw an angel. This is Revelation 19, 17, and 18. I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the 
the birds that fly in the midst of heaven. Come, that's in that, in that cloud, sky. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. He's serving bird, by the way. That you may eat the flesh of kings. I'm sorry, he's, he's serving kings for the birds. The flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men. The flesh of horses and those who sit on them. And the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. What he's saying, this angel is proclaiming, he says, Hey, all you birds, come here and feast. feast. Have a feast. And what's he saying to anybody else that might be listening? He's saying, oh, by the way, you're dead on arrival. Now, you've done lost the war. You should have read the Bible. You should have. Yeah. And by the way, there will be Bibles floating around out there. People will have a chance to read <coughs> especially in the fact that first three and a half years, in fact, during that period of time, more people will come to Christ, as recorded in the Bible, than any other time in history. Any other time in history. <clears throat> there, there's so many people that uh, John says, I can't even count. With the church, he says thousands upon thousands, uh, ten thousands upon ten thousand, but to the, the number that came during the Great Tribulation, yeah. a number so great that nothing could count Billions of people during that period of time. It's, it's funny what a woodshed will do. Yeah. And that's what happens. God is spanking his creation. If they won't realize that I love them when I tell them I love them, when I died for them, uh, I'll come give them a spanking. And they'll realize that I am God. Yeah. And, and they, they will. They'll come. Uh, many of these people that we pray for, these kids that uh, have gone astray or whatever, uh, and they don't believe what we believe, uh, maybe once we're gone, they'll believe what we believe, especially if you plop a little Bible around the house, leave, them, leave the Bible, yes. full, or leave the house full of food, so that they'll stick around. <laughs> These verses above are simple, simple, simple. Pretty straightforward. Come feast on the flesh of kings. Once again, God of all creation has let everyone know that the battle against him is futile. Mm. This angel is actually proclaiming to all of those who come against God are dead on arrival. I already used that line, okay? Yeah. Last week when we studied the return of Christ, do you remember last week we showed this picture? Mm -hmm. Remember, all we had was half a picture. You remember that? Tonight I'm showing you the whole picture. Look, look at what's coming. <laughs> and look at the idiots down below. <laughs> now mind you, this is just an artist's conception of what we've read and what we're studying. But you gotta, you gotta wonder, how bright is this? These people in, in the army. Well, I don't think it's intelligence. I think it's conviction. I, I, I think that these people are worshiping their leader. Yep. Like I know they are. They've taken a mark on them to worship yes. their leader. Yep. If they didn't, they couldn't be in the army. Maybe the kings of the East, I don't know, everybody there is going to have that mark on them. But because Jesus did reach out to them, remember? And, and with that red light, red writing that we just read. But anyway, let's read this. We should. When we studied the return of Christ, we showed everyone an artist's conception of this great battle. In that picture, it's this one over here. Christ was coming on the clouds of heaven with his army, which, of which we, his wife, are part. The enemies of God who are led by Satan are the Antichrist, the false prophet. They're, they're like little ants. See the picture of them down here? The enemies of God who are led by Satan are, and the false prophet are like little ants in the path of God Almighty. The angel is proclaiming a great feast on their flesh. He is inviting the birds of the air to be the supper of the great God. Sadly, these men are all part of God's creation. This is what's sad. 
I don't think it gives God any joy. Okay? No, I, I think it gave... Bible re reports joy from God when he hung on the cross, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And God got joy out of going to the cross for it. But I don't believe that God's going to get any joy out of this, but it's one of those things that has to be. Uh, the end is coming, and they have to either die or they can't live anywhere that... Like father telling her kid this hurts me more than it does you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not totally. Yeah. I never bought that, but... Uh, <laughs> but he made them. All of these people down here are his creation shooting at him. Yeah, that would be... I mean, even if my little granddaughter took a BB gun and shot it at me, I still think that's pretty bad. And it would hurt. Wow. And it would hurt. She wouldn't do that, but she will snap my suspenders off. Um, <laughs> he made them, and now the birds will eat the flesh that God created. Sad, isn't it? That's a real scene coming to a real world with real people. Yes. That's what's sad. It's not far down the road. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war. This is that fulfillment of the scripture about Armageddon. Gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. They're getting together, they're getting ready to shoot. Okay? As John continues to watch heaven go into battle against the men of the earth. He reports that he saw the beast. He saw that man yeah. of sin who will be commanding the world's army. He was there at the site of the battle and John says he saw the beast as they gathered together to make war. You know, you cannot help but wonder what do these people think that are going, what do they think they're going to do? Put yourself in that situation right there. What do they think they're going to do? I think by about that time they might be rethinking it. Yeah, they, they might. See it, right? They see Give all of us coming at them, they might be rethinking it. I don't think so. I think that it becomes a mom mentality. Well, that yes. could be. That this time is mom mentality. Mom mentality. You know. Mom mentality. I even have another view yeah. of it. They are, they are following their leader. Right. They are loyal to their leader. They have worshipped their leader. Amen. They want that mark. They know it. They want it. They took it knowing it goes to hell. That's right. There's no mistake. No. They're, they signed up. They, like when you join a gang, blood in and blood out. You know, the same sort of thing. You know, they, they knew when they joined. Yeah. I, I, I've been there, Michael. So, I know. So, uh, one can't help but wonder what these people think they're going to do. How do they plan to fight against an omnipotent God? Where are their brains? Why do they even think they could stand a chance? Actually, believe it or not, the answer is found in chapter 13, verse 4. And see exactly what Paul and I are talking about here. Saying, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying... Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? They believed that. And they believed that was their slogan. Who is able to make war with the beast? And, and they march to that tone. And they march off to, to somebody who is able to make war with the beast. Because that's the answer to that question. Jesus is going to show them who can make war with the beast. They believed the lie. You know, more and more and more and more people today are believing the lie. Oh, yes. If I tell you that two plus two is five, yeah. over and over and over and over, pretty soon you believe the lie. People are living their lives 
but they're living a lie. Uh, God says it this way, that he will turn them over to a retrobate mind. Uh, and this is not to say that I don't believe, I believe that God will give everybody a chance to receive him, because that is his mark. Yes. But they're so deep into the lie. They have marched all this way down the Euphrates River, brought their little tanks and their BB guns, and they're down there. They believe the lie. We have people in this world today who have already signed up for this man's sin army. Believe it. Yeah. Uh, anybody watch the uh, Academy Awards? No. No. You no. didn't miss anything. Yeah. It was satanic. Uh, the, the, was it was it the Academy Awards or wait, maybe it was the Music Awards. The Grammys, where they were singing all Where they were singing that they were all that dressed as Grammys, yeah. Grammys. They were all dressed up in, in Satan costumes oh, and yes. they were worshiping the beast. And I'm not talking about in seven years. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about on screen today yes. worshiping the beast. And they won the Academy Award or the uh, the major award, the best song of the year. Yeah. They normally replace the truth with a lie. Yeah. So right. the, Lieutenant Commander Hamas has said, you know what Israel's weakness is? They love life. We do not. There you go. And, and, and this is something that, I mean, this is straight up satanic. Yeah, absolutely. You can go see 72 virgins. Happening before our very eyes. And by the way, we need to pray for Israel, but don't be surprised. In the last days, Israel will stand alone. When we read the famous story of the invasion from the north, uh, battle of uh, invasion of uh, Gog and Magog from the north, uh, we don't see any kind of United States stepping in. They could have had that little line or something. But then the nation from across the pond, or however they want to word it, yes. would come. Nobody there. stands with Israel. They stand alone. And that's, by the way, this might be a little hard to understand. <laughs> that's the way God wants it. Yes. Because at that point, God will step in. And the whole purpose of that invasion, as this is, is so they will see the hand of God. Yeah. Well, let's read on. They believe the lie. We have people in this world today who have already signed up for this man's army. We see people in Hollywood, politics, uh, school boards, and in everyday life. They love evil, and they want no part of a righteous God. The prophet Isaiah said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who puts darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5, 20. These people that are with the Antichrist are as bad as the Antichrist. They believe the same thing as the Antichrist. Uh, that's why they're following him. They are worshiping him. Uh, unfortunately, their destination will be the same as that of the beast of whom they follow. This <coughs> finishes up. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who works signs in his presence. Get that? They're going to capture the beast, the Antichrist. By the way, the beast, we keep calling him the beast. Keep in mind, everybody, the beast is a man. Does anybody remember what his number is? Oh, see, you knew that. You probably knew that before you were Christian. It's right up there with Armageddon. We, we know what 666 means, and we know what Armageddon means. We know what uh, the apocalypse means. Uh, but we don't know where it comes from. Tonight we'll find out where it comes from. Uh, yeah, so Mr. 666, uh, the most incomplete, incomplete, incomplete man of, of all time. All man is the number six until they receive Christ. Then they become the number seven. We are incomplete. That's what the number six means in the Bible. So the Antichrist, the beast, a man, is a 666. Six, six. Um, so they're going to capture the 666 guy. They're going to capture the uh, uh, false prophet. Okay. 
saying, let me pick up a read. Then the beast was captured within the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Okay? These two were cast, get this one everybody, these two were cast alive. They weren't dead. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword, yes. which proceeded from the mouth of him who yes. sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Yes. Hmm. So, we pretty much saw the, everybody that's downstairs looking up, shooting. <clears throat> The, the beast and the false prophet are captured and they're thrown into the lake of fire, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and the rest are going to be killed with the sword that proceeds from the mouth of him who sets on the horse. We talked about that last week. We talked about the word of God is more powerful than any two-edged sword. We're getting our apocalyptic writing from a man uh, named... John, an apostle, who in John 1.1 1, 1 identified exactly who the Word of God is. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, uh, and, but he's calling him the Word. He, we even went back into uh, the creation story last week where we talked about uh, that sword and, and the triunal God is seen even in the very beginning. In the beginning, God that God the Father created the heavens and the earth, and the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering. Then God spoke. Yeah. When God spoke, that speaking is, in fact, the Word of God, the three in one. So the Word of God is the one who created all things. Colossians says, in him all things were created. John says the same thing, nothing was created that was created. Uh, <clears throat> the Word of God is very, very powerful. Now, I don't believe in this glorious setting, it, at least you don't have a picture of a sword coming from his mouth, that uh, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, and it's a big sword coming out of his mouth. They were killed with the sword of his, from his mouth. He spoke. When, the, when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come out. He gave life to a dead body. He can give death to live bodies. So yes. all Jesus had to say was, you're dead. <laughs> and what's left? The bodies are being eaten by, oh. the, by the, uh, the body. The grapes, uh, uh, the story about the, the wrath of God and, and the grapes of wrath, uh, that, that's symbolically talking about all the blood that was shed in this great battle. Yep. This is all the warriors of the earth. This war, let's read with me. <clears throat> oh, I'm doing a lot of talking tonight. See, Barbara, it doesn't make any difference. I've got three pages, four pages, five pages. I talk just as much. No, you talk more. When you got five pages, you hurry up and get. Oh, you've got on, dude. <laughs> hey, I wrote this over. Billy wanted me to work yesterday. You know, he said he's gonna oh, fire no. me if I don't. And uh, <laughs> uh, and he had to do stuff in time. And Sandy went into town to do some, some errands and stuff. So I said, "Didn't I, guys? I sat there. Well, you weren't there, but Jimmy and Jamie. I put those guys up. I sat in." Billy's house and wrote this all out and Sandy and I typed it up last night. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just keep writing. Billy's got the whip after you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you I'm not really worried about him. I'm worried about his wife. <laughs> no. Billy either gets that place done or he's got to move into my place. <laughs> oh, so you're worried about your wife, not his wife. Yeah. <laughs> and he can't even move into the fifth wheel. The girls call that's their that's that's their clubhouse now. Oh. Anyway, we got this.
fifth wheel. It, it's old, but it's big. And the girls have taken it over to their clubhouse. I'm not supposed to tell this to people, but the only way you can get in there if you know the password. <laughs> and the password, believe it or not, is clean. Well, they go over there, they'll clean their clubhouse. You think they clean their bedroom? No. <laughs> but they'll go clean the clubhouse. Maybe you need to make a password to their bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No okay, here we go. This war will be over very quickly. But first, the beast, the false prophet, are both captured and they are taken together into a place called the Lake of Fire. Okay, that is an actual place. Okay, we've talked about yes. symbolic things. Okay, but the false prophet is real. The Antichrist is real. They're both men. Where are they being thrown into? The Lake, Lake of Fire. Fire. Okay. And they're being thrown there alive. At this time, Satan, their big boss, is still here on earth. Scripture does not say that he was present at the Battle of Armageddon. We will see this, his doom, however, in chapter 20 next week. But as for the beast and his assistant, the false prophet, they will be the first to enter this place of torment. For those who are, were left after the two leaders were removed, their bodies will be given to the vultures of the air. Their souls, hey, get this though, they're dead, right? What happens to the dead, okay? The souls are going to reappear <clears throat> in a very short time, in chapter, chapter, well, it's going to be a thousand years. But their souls will reappear in chapter 20 of the great white throne judgment. At that judgment, anyone not found written in the book of life, then they will be cast into that same lake of fire. <clears throat> not a good place to go. Here in the scripture above is a description of how they will die. They were killed with a sword that proceeds from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, from the mouth of Jesus, from the mouth of the man that uh, from the, <laughs> the man that the apostle John identified in his gospel as the word of God. All creation only exists because why? God spoke it into yeah. existence. Um, the sword that proceeds from the mouth of God, this word can say to Lazarus, I already said this, come out and restore the very breath of life to a dead man. Or this very uh, word can say, life be gone, and that life is gone. Okay? I totally believe that God will say to his creation below, who are coming against him, life be gone. And that's how quickly the big famous War of Armageddon of which movies and books have been written uh, and heroes have come forth and Achilles and whatnot have um, fought against. It's hard to figure out in these movies who the actual hero is because um, it's not really a battle, is it? <coughs> Do you see a battle going on here? No, the, um, all these people who are just wanting to die are going to get their wish. Yes. By the way, uh, that's another reason maybe a lot of people might follow after the Antichrist. It's not their God. Although I think that's going down with the uh, harlot religion. The Antichrist will remove religion from the face of the earth. Why? Because there's going to be a new religion. It's going to be worship yeah. the beast religion. Yeah. And it's, he's going to be so easy to worship. He's great. <laughs> he's powerful. He's they make an image of him and he walks around. He talks. Time's up. <laughs> oh, my. They're setting alarms now. God will say to his creation, coming against him, life be God. Nothing is left but a dead body which is only good for feeding the birds of the air. Yeah. When you get thinking how mighty you are, you might think that God can turn you into bird food really quick. Really quick. Conclusion. The Battle of Armageddon is a sad commentary on the state of mankind. In the Garden of Eden, I wrote this when I was watching you guys work yesterday, James, up on the scaffold. 
In the Garden of Eden, man chose to rebel against God with the simple action of disobedience. That disobedience continued for 1,700 years until... Yeah, I already got corrected on that by Richard. Uh, that disobedience continued for 1,700 years. Okay, look where the comma down. Oh, bad, bad, bad. Until God looked down on his creation and saw the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. At that time, um, God brought the flood, right? Yep. About 1,700 years after creation. But then man was given another chance through uh, the family of Noah. Yeah. But do never forget, eight sinners went into the ark, eight sinners walked out of the ark. Amen. Had man changed? No. no. He was still forged in sin. Uh, 2,000 years later, God sent his son into the world to stand in the gap for sinful man and pay the penalty for sin. However, man, even his chosen nation, rejected him. We have a world out there who has rejected the salvation of Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sins. 2,000 more years have come and gone, and still man is choosing rebellion against the very one who died for them. It is, a sad, it is sad, but this scene is coming to us. Right here, to us. And it's coming at lightning speed. Five years ago, somebody said to me, there's a whole bunch of people over there uh, carrying signs to have their children uh, change from boy to girl, that they're teaching it now in the, in the grade school. Yes. Uh, I would say, huh? They're not, nobody would do that. Not in the society we live in. Uh, or that churches are hanging uh, LGBTQ signs and saying, we need to get with the, the modern day Black Lives Matter and, and all these secular things that are out there and turning their church into acceptance. Uh, uh, disobedience is being replaced by uh, inclusion. All these things that come at us in the last yes. five years. Yes. Amen. Black flies. <laughs> but there's coming at lightning speed. There's only one way out of what is coming to our door. And there's only one door by which we might make that exit. That door is the one who is coming to that great day of God Almighty, which is a battle, and we call it Armageddon. Therein lies the great battle of Armageddon. It started when John looked and saw the spirits coming out of the kings of the earth. As And they went and received the kings of the east. They came down the river Euphrates. Yeah, it is. But it's going to be dried up and really quick. Yes. Pastor Don, would you lead us out of here? I'm right on time for change. Heavenly Father, we come before you now to thank you for this lesson, Father. Thank you for reminding for it being instilled in us that we are seeing these things happening quicker and quicker, Father. And that our responsibility, Father, is to spread your word and give all everybody the opportunity to accept your son Jesus Christ as the only way we have to spend an eternal life with you. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit continue to be with us as we go our separate ways. That help us to stay focused on you and the gospel, Father. May we obey everything that you tell us to do and, and ask that you continue to watch over us and keep us safe. Forgive us of our sins and transgressions, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.